All right, legends, welcome to a brand new week. Welcome back to a brand new video on Celtic AM. Apologies that I didn't manage to get a video out on Friday. I was shock horror doing other things and I just kind of ran out of time. So apologies for that. I did enjoy some of your replies to the wee post I put out saying that I'd like ruined your Friday and ruined your weekend and all of that stuff. Hopefully that wasn't the case. Certainly hopefully Celtic um, put you right back on an upper on Saturday with her 3-1 win over St Johnson. That's what we're chatting about on today's video and we've got some other bits and bobs to cover as well. I was quite impressed um, with the way we started the match and the, the kind of tempo and intent that the team showed because that hasn't always been, you know, obvious uh, in matches this season, especially at Celtic Park. But I felt there was real intent from us at the start, you know, intent to take the game to St. Johnson, intent to uh, press St. Johnson and win the ball back when we didn't have it. That was really clear to me. Um, and that kind of went through most of the performance and most of the match. Yeah, there were kind of dips here and there, but to be honest, I don't think anyone's expecting you know, a 90-minute superb performance from this Celtic team uh, at this stage of the season. It is about just kind of um, winning matches and, and winning matches as effortless, effortlessly as possible. And I felt that we did that. I don't think it was a game that was ever really in doubt on Saturday, and that's about as much as you can ask now, the performance for me was led by a couple of players. The first one would be Nicholas Kuhn, who is so clearly uh, a different player from the one we saw in his early weeks. And I know that always gets the, the conversation going about whether we're too quick to judge players. And I guess as a support, we are. The only point I would make to counteract that sometimes is you do need to call it as you see it in the early days. And Kuhn, to me, in the early days... Um, looked like he had no confidence and no purpose. It looked like he didn't want to even be there half of the time. In his last couple of matches, he has been superb and he looks like a really talented, industrious, um, you know, bundle of energy, to be honest. What I really like about him is he can go either way. When he sizes the fullback up, he can just as easily go inside as he can go down the line. And we've actually seen him kind of create some of his better moments so far by just drifting inside. He, he kind of does it effortlessly and it's almost like the defender doesn't know what to do. Um, and when he gets into that area, he looks like a winger who can actually cross. And I can't remember the last winger we had who could genuinely cross. I'm going to have a think. The wingers we've had recently, a lot of them like have kind of been people arriving at the back post to score goals or people who like work really hard for the team. Um, you know, someone like Dai Zemaida or Lee Labada and, and score goals, but maybe don't have that kind of creative spark. Is that a little bit harsh? Whereas I think, you know, you know, even folk like Yang uh, so far this season, Palma, you don't really see them, you know, putting many kind of, delicious, scooped, curled-in crosses into the box like we saw from Kuhn at the weekend. So he's certainly different from what we've got. Help me out if you can think of, you know, the last real kind of good crossing winger. I'm maybe forgetting someone obvious. But anyway, my point is that Kuhn can clearly do that and he's laid a couple on in the, the last two matches. One for Maida, um, you know, against Livingston. One for Kyogo at the weekend. You know, really nice goals to watch. He's aware of what the movement is and he's able to, to find them with those balls. So I really like that. Obviously, the fact he got his, his first goal at Celtic Park was, was really good as well. He's obviously scored a, a goal at Pataudry already, but this was, you know, a really clean finish right at the start of the second half. So... I really like him. Um, I want to see him in the team against Livingston, even though Yang is back. I think Yang clearly has something, and listen, we were all raving about him, you know, 10 days ago, and I'm not changing my opinion on Yang at all. But I think Kuhn maybe has the edge based on the last couple of performances. Like, I think they've been really, really strong displays. So impressed with him. Now, for me, the big positive, the big takeaway 
from the match on Saturday uh, was Kyogo Furuhashi seemingly being back to his best and doing what he does best. I mean, how many times during that game was Kyogo stretching the St. Johnson defence, running in behind? It's something we've not seen him do as often this season. He has been doing much more coming to the ball. On Saturday, for me, right from kickoff, it was Kyogo of old, you know, as I say, stretching the game, making runs in behind. He should have scored more than one goal on Saturday. He hit the, the underside of the bar. He had those two goals ruled out for offside. He, he stuck away the first one from Bernardo's cross where, you know, he's, he's clearly offside. And the second one where it was Maida, who again is, is offside and he, he squares it to you. Kyogo to finish and even Kyogo's goal uh, that did stand was very marginal and, and very similar to the one that he scored against Kilmarnock a few weeks ago I thought but the very fact that he's having these kind of tight offside calls is, is a good sign I think and he's had a few of them in recent weeks I feel like previously that wasn't happening so to me that's a sign that his movement is really coming back and as we all know Kyogo has like the best movement well I've ever seen it at Celtic and yeah, I've been following the team since like going to games since like 2005. I can't think of anyone who, who comes close to his movement. So yeah, excellent stuff for him. You know, quite simply, I feel something has clicked. I commented on it when he came on at Tynecastle and that really disappointed defeat. I felt something was different there. Maybe it just took him being kind of taken out of the limelight for a couple of games and Adamida going up front for Kyogo to reset and come back. And yeah, if he plays like that, he's going to score a, a fair few goals before the end of the season. And it's going to be hugely um, influential for us as we go for the, the league and cup double. So yeah, that was the the big positive for me. Kyogo looks back um, to his best and that's very positive for us. Um, yeah, overall, I thought it was a good display, touching on a, a few other players. Uh, Iwata had a, a good game. I've seen a few comments, people saying he's maybe playing it a little bit too safe when he's in possession. Yeah, possibly. There's a few examples of that. To be honest, I'm kind of happy for him generally just to do the simple things well. I feel like that's his game. And I think he'll be better when he's got someone like Rio Hitati or Callum McGregor next to him, if that's how things work out. Um, I do think Paolo Bernardo was a little bit kind of... Um, anonymous again and I know he had that cross for the Kyogo goal that was ruled offside but he just doesn't impact games enough for me and I still feel there's a at least one space in that midfield to be sorted out and you know hopefully Real Hitati is going to be taking that very soon. Greg Taylor I thought had a good game, uh, quite industrious. I think Cameron Carter-Vickers was you know makes a big difference to that defence, but that's, you know, hardly um, news in that regard. And for me, it was no surprise to see the team conceding a pretty sloppy goal minutes after Carter Vickers went off. And yes, yeah, I guess it's a, a disappointment to, to lose another cheap goal. We've been doing that a lot in games recently. We just can't seem to keep clean sheets at the moment. But in the grand scheme of things, I'm not going to you know, moan about it. It was a good performance on Saturday. 3-1 did massively flatter St. Johnson when you consider the amount of chances we missed, the penalty we should have that had that I'm certainly not going to comment on here um, because there's, you know, bigger, more important things going on. Um, and yeah, it just it feels to me, I don't know if you agree, that there's just something building there. I don't know exactly what is being built, but it feels... Like there's some sort of momentum being kind of gathered and certainly there's far more positivity you know amongst the, our support than there was you know a few weeks ago where things were very bleak now that's no guarantee of you know success this season we've still got a lot to do and are, are, we're going to get far have far bigger tests than St Johnson let's be honest but I just feel like there's something to be positive about there and when you know hopefully we'll have Rio Hitati back after the break maybe Callum McGregor back soonish then you know there, there's even more you know reasons to be positive Yang you know be an option again from our, our next game so I think certainly this weekend was a lot better than last weekend and improvement is is what we're looking for at this stage it does obviously help as well that we are 
top of the league after the weekend. Rangers' visit to Dundee was postponed yesterday after the eight pitch inspections. So we are a point ahead. Obviously, they still have that game in hand to play, but it is a game that they'll have to fit in before the league splits into two. That's because Dundee are still in with a pretty decent shout of making the top six. The Rangers will have to play that game probably the midweek before we go to Ibrox. Is that an advantage for us? Um, well, I made a fool of myself a couple of seasons ago after one of their Europa League matches when we played them in the Scottish Cup semi a few days later. I felt that it was a certain Celtic win because they'd gone to extra time a couple of days before and they beat us and outran us and looked fitter than us. So, yeah, I'm making no grand statement about them having a midweek game affecting the derby in any way. Um, other than saying, like, I probably would rather they had one than not. Um, we can have our feet up during the midweek while they have to go to Dens Park. So, And obviously we've got the points on the board, whereas you, you'd always rather have that than games in hand. But yeah, it's still very much as it was at the top, even though we have gone ahead of them now. So we've kind of managed to come through a pretty tough period with a, a lot of tough away games and a lot of kind of negativity at the club, both on and off the pitch. And we're still in with a, a good shout, I would say, of, of, you know, winning the league and we're obviously in the cup as well. Whether we do or not, that will be determined by those bigger tests in the second half of the season. But I'm feeling relatively good about things. We've got players to come back. It feels like, I don't know, there's just something kind of brewing there. But as I say, we'll, we'll find out far more about the team over our coming matches. Now, we do go into um, the international break. And on that, Brendan Rodgers told Celtic TV, there will be a little bit of rest, but there's still work to be done. We'll have a game behind closed doors and get one or two of our players up to speed. Pretty sure Rio Hatati will be one of those players. Cameron Carter-Vickers probably as well. Um, interesting to see what the situation is with Callum McGregor as well. I would certainly hope that those rumours that we had a few weeks ago about him not playing again this season will be unfounded. And hopefully we will see him, as I say, relatively soon, if not back right away. Um, but I think Rio Hitati, you know, will be a, a big player coming back for us. Uh, elsewhere on Saturday, we had the North Curve Celtic um, with a St. Patrick's Day Tifo. You can see there, uh, that was before kick-off. They say uh, that is defying current restrictions on Tifos at Celtic Park. And I'll admit that I didn't know there was a restriction on Tifos at Celtic Park. So that's interesting. Uh, we also got a bit of patter from Brendan Rodgers, and we love a bit of that. Um, he was asked by, I think, Sky Sports uh, whether he would be tuning in for Dundee versus Rangers 24 hours later, and he replied, I'll be celebrating St. Patrick's Day as an Irishman. Just as well you didn't postpone your plans, Brendan. In terms of other match-related stuff uh, from the weekend, uh, a big well done to the women's side who defeated Rangers 2-1 to move just a point behind them at the top of the SWPL. It was Tash Flint that scored both of our goals, both in the first half. So that's another title race that looks like it's going to go down to the wire. Interestingly, the club did recently announce that two of our upcoming SWPL fixtures against Hearts, that's on April the 21st, and Hibs on May the 19th would be taking place at Celtic Park. Hopefully we get some pretty healthy crowds like we did for a couple of games this time last year as the SWPL title race hots up. And in another announcement, sort of, from the club, we had this image uh, posted on our social media channels yesterday, appearing to suggest that the club will be travelling to the United States during pre-season in the summer. Now, if I know one thing, it's American monuments. So let me just guide you through what we're looking at here and stuff that I definitely didn't Google. <sighs> right, on the left there, you've got the, uh, the Washington Monument, which was built in the 19th century to commemorate George Washington, who is, as you'll no doubt know, a founding father of the United States. Now in the centre, behind the flags, we have the, the University of Notre Dame in Notre Dame, Indiana. 
That was founded by French priest Edouard Soran in 1842. And finally on the right, that would be the Moorhead Patterson Bell Tower, and that's in North Carolina. That's a 172-foot tall tower that was completed in 1931. So Washington DC, Indiana and North Carolina. Not really sure exactly where we'll be playing, but those are the states and not really sure about the opposition either. English teams never seem to be too far away from the states during summer pre-season, so maybe there'll be a game or two there against English sides. Uh, would make sense to play an MLS team, I guess, given that um, we are going to the States. But yeah, that will all be announced by the club at some stage, I'm sure. And we can all look forward to a pre-season and some big matches. Um, we've certainly been getting back into the big overseas trips during close season in recent times, haven't we? So this is a, a continued push from the club. I'm sure we'll hear uh, confirmation on this very soon and they'll definitely not put out about a million tweets over the next six weeks promoting every single match and tickets and all of that kind of stuff. Anyway, speak to you tomorrow.